Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So, so you on first? Yeah, don't we need to escape. Um, Hello everyone, we're going to start the talk in a couple of minutes, so if you can make your way through the auditorium, thank you. <laughs> 
Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, so we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers tonight. Um, first of all, we have Ricardo Silva from UCL and Alan Turing Institute. Um, and afterwards, we have David Silva from Google DeepMind uh, and UCL. Um, so starting off with Ricardo, um, and then for 45 minutes, and then we'll have a quick uh, few minutes on community announcements. So if anyone has anything that they want to announce or they're hiring, whatever, come up and uh, give you your announcement um, at the end of Ricardo's talk. Over to you, Ricardo. All right. Can people hear me well? Is the mic on? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's great to be here. I was just speaking to the organizers that the last time I spoke at the Machine Learning Meetup was about five years ago, <clears throat> and we had way fewer people. So it's good to see this community growing, too. So this is joint work with uh, several collaborators. What's going to happen here, I'm going to try and probably fail to give an overview of many different topics I've been working on. Uh, hopefully, at least some of the messages stick even though I try to be maybe slightly over ambitious on the amount of ground I'm trying to cover here. So without further ado, I'd like first to start um, <clears throat> with some notions of what do you understand by causal inference in AI and statistics? Because I still think it's not a, that well of a consolidated topic, even though people have been doing great research on that from AI luminaries like you, Pearl, for decades. So I spent some time at the beginning trying to explain a little bit what is there that you mean when you talk about causal inference, about causal learning? <clears throat> so I think the most abstract and yet correct way of defining that is, is all about understanding the effects of actions on your observations. So this, find, this looks very general, of course. It's related to many things in AI, many things in the popular press that you see. And maybe one of the reasons why interest has picked up recently is because of popular science books like Udapro's own book of why that was released last year where he tries to give an overview of his own research, some historic account on <clears throat> how causal inference uh, raised in the empirical sciences, but it can trace back to many years ago. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure many of you are, are familiar with this blog and book, Freakonomics, by some economists. And essentially, everything there is about applying causal inference to social science economics. So you have to understand that these ideas are not necessarily new, but sometimes having a fresh perspective on it, particularly given all these advancements, these recent advancements in AI and machine learning, might inspire you to new directions of research. Now, as I said, it's all about understanding the effects of actions. You may say, this is old hat. We know this is present in many tasks in AI, like planning and reinforcement learning, but there are different aspects to it. So when you do planning, essentially have a causal model there, right? You run an optimization problem on finding the best actions. This causal model is embedded on it because it's all about the effects of actions. But the real challenge there is the computation because there is no causal inference per se if you already provide a causal model to that. The same thing to some aspects of reinforcement learning. They see where it's going to be a terrific talk after this, <clears throat> where even though you may learn how to optimize a policy, your data in one sense are multi causal samples from a known causal model. So if you want to optimize a policy given a simulator, your simulator is the causal model. You're, do, you're learning something new, which is how to create an optimal policy without having to do the, the explicit computations for that. But again, it starts with a causal model given. You're not really doing causal inference on there. <clears throat> so this really appears when you want to actually act in the real world and you realize that performing actions is not necessarily cheap. And more than that, you may realize that the actions that you see in your data were selected in some uncontrolled and known way. And somehow you have to live with that. So perhaps the most classic example is this, maybe the, the poster success story of epidemiology, find a link in between smoking and lung cancer. In this talk, I'm going to use these diagrams to represent uh, Causal relationships, basically the arrow indicates the direction of causation. There are formal ways of defining that. I'm not going to go into formalities on this representation, but just I hope that you understand that intuition, that these values are meant to represent random variables, and the arrows are meant to represent direction of causation. <clears throat> so one thing that's going to be common in many of my examples is in many cases, you don't measure everything that you need to measure. So if you think about the case between smoke and lung cancer, you might have all sorts of confounders that explain the association that you see. 
When you talk about the effect of an action, you essentially want to disentangle what is due to controlling the smoking variable and what is due to the association that comes from common causes. So in order to understand the difference between association and causation that is normally done in the literature is to precisely specify action variables, which are not random variables. They denote the choice of an action. And this choice is not a random variable. So the way they have a full-fledged causal model is to actually, as I mentioned to you, represent how actions and random variables are interconnected. So if you think about the golden standard of uh, empirical sciences, the randomized controlled trial, you can think of this action variable as a decision whether given to an individual a particular treatment. So a typical randomized controlled trial, you randomly sample which treatment to give to that individual. So this is your policy. So this indicates this idea of your randomly sample which uh, value this variable takes. And this means that you're controlling that. And whatever you see in the natural population, so to speak, is overridden. You're basically saying, OK, <clears throat> when I see epidemiological data, I know there's uh, reasons why people choose to smoke. If you're able to do a randomized controlled trial, I would override that. And the way this translates into causal diagrams by deletions of errors. So imagine you're overriding that error with some other policy which in this case is meant to sample data on different levels of intervention. Uh, so of course, it's a fantasy for this case because nobody would ever do that, at least not in a democracy. This would be totally unethical to do a randomized trial in smoking. But the question remains in terms of <clears throat> how do you describe that in a hypothetical randomized control trial? How do you relate that to the data that you actually have without doing the experiment? So you can think that once you use a randomized controlled trial to come up with what you understand the effects of actions there, you can also think about other ways of manipulating these variables, such as trying to create campaigns for uh, anti-smoking attitudes and so on and so forth. But the whole idea boils down to that. The random variables are interactive actions. In this diagram, I kind of just showing to you how this interaction takes place. <clears throat> Now, this is one alternative representation you might find in the literature. So this is actually what I'm going to use most here. Just thinking about the variable that are controlling itself as being the action variable. So it does mean here, this is not a random variable anymore. This is a control signal. And then, of course, the response might depend probabilistically on that. Right, so please interrupt me any point for questions because, as I said, I actually don't think I'm going to finish all the slides I prepared. I'm very happy just for people to understand these basics here. So if something is not clear immediately, I'm happy to uh, come up with clarifications. <clears throat> okay. But as I mentioned to you, there's a fantasy that you can control these common causes in many cases. And in many cases also, this may be unknown. This may be a latent variable, a hidden variable, as you say here. When you cannot randomize, what you try to do is to measure these common causes. So you can think of, for example, you postulate it is a genetic factor <clears throat> that gives people tendency to want to smoke. At the same time, for some reasons unknown, the genetic factor also triggers uh, increased likelihood of developing lung cancer. <clears throat> so if you make a hypothesis like that, this would be a representation of that. And somehow, without doing the randomized control trial, we'd like to understand what is the cause effect. The typical idea behind that is uh, you want to pretend, you want to model this uh, edge as if it doesn't exist. And then you think, OK, let's see all possible values that this common cause might take. You may want to summarize that by some measure of the genomic structure. You condition on that, stratify the population on that, see what happens when you fix that, regardless of the original association between these two factors. So this is an emulation of breaking the edge by randomization. So you fix that in a model, you average over that, and then you get what the association between smoking and cancer would be had you controlled the smoking baseline by design. So conditional factors are the common causes you want. <clears throat> Fix the value of the treatment, average over these common, common causes that you postulate. This will give you an analog of what the randomized controlled trial gives to you. 
Of course, you have to measure that to be able to, uh, to learn this relationship between causes and outcomes. Now, the problem, of course, with this idea, which is once since the basic fundamental idea of observation study, is that you may have confounders that didn't measure. So this would add to the association of these guys and not necessarily explain the, cause, the causation between these factors. So this is such an argument that the tobacco companies came up with across the decades. Or you try to explain this in a nice little study that uh, all these confounders have been measured, but you forgot that guy. Maybe people's sloppy lifestyle were prone to start smoking and to expose themselves to other risk factors that imply lung cancer. And then if you wanted to disprove this hypothesis, you play this game again, you measure that. But strictly speaking, you can play this game indefinitely. So there is, a, there is a level of untestability when you have an observation study. It's just something that you cannot completely shake off. If you have a firm belief that smoke causes lung cancer today, it's because you have many different observation studies that agree with this conclusion. We have twin studies. You have studies uh, about the, me the mechanisms, the biological mechanisms. You have indirect evidence from secondhand smokers and so on. You basically pull off many different observation studies to tell a convincing story. Now, <clears throat> if you think about the modeling behind that, operationally boils down to this. So if you're just interested in predicting lung cancer given smoking, if you work, for example, for an insurance company, you don't need causation for that. Get your data, plug in the data you have. You can predict whether somebody will develop lung cancer given that person is a smoker. But in public policy, you want a different type of predictive problem. Is if you control smoking, is still the case that, or to which extent is the case that people have a probability of developing lung cancer? These two probabilities don't need to agree because they correspond to different generative stories. And the generative story here is that the association between these guys has been broken. So this one in general can potentially be completely different because they come from different models. It doesn't mean though, and that's the essential aspect of causal modeling with observational data, it doesn't mean that these models are disconnected completely. They must share something common between them, otherwise you cannot learn anything from an observation study. And what's postulated here is just like in a graphical model, just, just like in those ideas of factorizing distribution, and there are some parts of the model will remain variant even under intervention. So the main assumption here is this invariance under an intervention. So if you want to intervene on this variable to make it an action instead of a random variable, the rest of the model remains invariant. So it boils down to say, the parameter has been shared between the model for this regime and the model for that regime. So potentially you can learn parameters here, transfer to that, and be able to answer hypothetical questions about what happens if I were to intervene on something. And that's the basic idea behind observation studies. Okay? So notice here that I introduced this notation here, this little do, <laughs> is a notation introduced by Uda Pearl. One of the reasons why he won a Turing Award was because of these little two letters there. It's a way of denoting the difference between condition on a random variable and condition on an actual index. So again, this is not a random variable, it's an index saying this is a regime where this guy takes this value. Okay, it allows you to reuse symbols, over, uh, overload symbols from different regimes in the calculus that allows you to reduce this problem to a problem where you are able to estimate parameters from an observation study. Okay? Now, one thing that you may ask is, okay, that assumed I was able to look at these confounders, stratify on them, do all these neat operations there to answer a question, but you also mentioned to me that the key issue there is that you may have hidden common causes. And, <clears throat> Putting a machine learning hat, so a statistical modeling hat, the first thing that may come to our mind is that maybe you can estimate these latent variables to be able to take them into account and do the same idea, condition on them, average, et cetera, et cetera. The problem, of course, is it's not very clear that this, this is possible at all 
depending on the structure of your problem. So you see from time to time, these papers that people try to hand fist a approach for learning these latent variables, then try to derive the cause effect of that. In many of these cases, if it works, it's because it's despite what they did, not because of what they did. Because in order for this to have any meaning, you have to be able to identify the quantity of interest from what you can see. And there's a lot missing that picture it may be the case that I have no idea what's going on in that picture. I'm going to show some examples of that and soon. I do recommend highly this paper by Lex Demo from Google Brain that does a great description of the main issues are and shoots down many recent papers in the machine learning literature on that. So to give you an example of what the problem is, suppose I have this very simple system we have something that takes the role of my treatment, like smoking, and something that takes the, the role of my outcome that I'm interested, like a health outcome. <laughs> I have some unspecified latent common cause. And to make things simple, everything here is a linear Gaussian model. So you have these equations describe what the condition distribution of which guy is given its parents in this graph. And the causal query, if you think a little bit, is tell me what this quantity C is. Because if you imagine this hypothetical intervention, A is deleted, A is set to zero as equivalently as a way of saying this, this edge disappears. If you change this guy by one unit, this changes in expectation by one unit. So I can describe a particular measure of cause effect by just this pattern with a C. Let's learn C from data. Well, if you have this idea of linear Gaussian data where you only observe the margin of x and y, then you can show essentially all you have is the covariance of x and y. And you can write algebraically what this means in terms of the parameters. You have this equation of x, what sigma of x, y is as a function of these parameters. It's not hard to derive this at all. And then realize you have more unknowns than things that you do observe. You not solve that. There's no way of estimating this from the data that you have. And that's the key issue, basically, of anything that relates to hidden common causes. And you have to, create, to be sort of creative and be able to get around that. Just fitting a latent variable model to that is not going to cut it. All right? So what I want to talk here is about a suite of different ways of trying to get around that. Uh, <clears throat> You know, the issues, as I mentioned to you, even though you have all these nice possibilities of being able to <clears throat> run a whole plan doing actions, if you're able to do that, great for you. In many cases, you don't have this data because it's just too expensive. Where if you have it, your sample size might be too small. If you want to do something like personalized medicine, doing a sequential dynamic treatment regime, you're not going to be playing with people for too long, so to speak. You're not going to run large randomized controlled trials for that. We have large databases of historical decisions done by doctors that decide which actions to take, and you have zero information on how they chose those actions. They will be confounded in your outcome. It would be even worse if you have a sequential plan. Everything might be confounded in everything. <clears throat> but you don't want to throw away this data. There's a lot of rich data there on historical decisions made by doctors that realize particular outcomes for patients. Don't want to ignore that. So you want to use this, but you do need cause assumptions for that to make sense. As this general saying says, you have to learn from their mistakes. Now they're going to live enough to do all those experiments. Don't know who said that. If you try to Google for that, basically the entire internet is, has been attributed to it. But if it, it kind of reflects the common sense of that. Let's not waste these opportunities that this observation of data gives us to us. <clears throat> So why, why do you think, why do we think, I think, and many people think that machine learning AI have to add to that? Because there, there's a large history of people from epidemiology and economics and political science so doing this type of analysis. So why us as machine learning and AI people think this is also something you can contribute to? Well, basically the traditional way of doing that in this literature that dates back at least to 19th century of John Snow, who was the guy who found out the reasons for cholera in Soho. This is the classical start of modern epidemiology. <clears throat> they basically do all sorts of very thought through, or hopefully thought through, 
theoretical reasons why they have measured the right confounders and so on and so forth. And that's great, you definitely need that, and definitely this type of uh, background knowledge about the structure of the problem. But sometimes you may want to, so to speak, kick the can to a higher level and think about, <clears throat> instead of having this really high, uh, very precise background knowledge, what if I have some sort of higher language, higher order language to describe somewhat more general assumptions, and from there derive the consequences of them. Realizing that deriving the consequences of these somewhat abstract assumptions can be computationally non-trivial. It may require very flexible models for that. So that's where this AI component starts to take place because these ways, these ways of deducing the consequences of these assumptions are not computationally trivial. And the models that you might want might not be the old workhorses like linear models. You may want to tackle, for example, a deep learning regression function on top of this and see what you get. So that's the direction you're going here. Okay, so I do want to uh, say a word of warning. Um, this is not like the traditional idea that AI is about autonomous systems. It's not like that at all. It's about a interaction between experts and models and algorithms. And somehow you have to understand that you may not have a name for a particular queries. You may be able to say, we tried from your assumptions, you tried from your data, to get an answer, guess what? Don't have enough information. I don't know what the answer is. So you need to be able to take the courage of be able to say that. Even if you're forced to make a decision that is, requires a causal model, that you had to somehow be able to say, okay, if you wanted to make really a decision here instead of just saying you don't know, you had to add more assumptions. Be aware of that, okay? So there are situations that, you, many practical situations where you may be able to tell an answer, answer. You may actually be able to say too many answers because you cannot distinguish which one is the right one. Not that it's gonna be an arbitrary answer, but you will be able to reduce the possibilities like finding bounds on a cause effect. <clears throat> this is what they call partially identifiable system. This technology comes from economics. You might not be able to provide the unique answer, but you might be able to restrict the possible answers to a, hopefully useful subset of possibilities. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so this was the background, basically half of the time I have, but I think you got that, I think you got already something good out of this. All right, um, so now this is when I start to talk about my own work. Uh, this is one piece of work done with Robin Evans a few years back, it's in Jamal 2016. It goes back to this particular question, we have these ideas of adjusting for confounders by just conditioning on their average over then, et cetera, et cetera. But can you do something more flexible than just requiring a, a very specific theory about who the confounders are? <clears throat> so to get to that, I'll just first I'll provide some background on some notation and some of the goals. Here for simplicity of variables are gonna be binary. <clears throat> There will be one treatment and one outcome of interest, like the smoke and lung cancer, smoking being treatment, lung cancer being the outcome. I'm going to call them X or Y. <clears throat> and there are many ways of trying to establish the causal link between them. The one that will be focusing is this thing called the average treatment effect. This is by far the most common way that people summarize a causal relationship quantitatively. So it's basically the change of an expectation of the outcome. So you have two levels of treatment by actually controlling it. So in Paro's notation, you know what it is, is instead of condition the random variable x taking the value of one, you're conditioned on the action variable x taking the value of one, okay? Uh, of course, since this is binary, this is equivalent to the probability of the outcome being equal to one. <clears throat> now we need extra assumptions on that. Uh, uh, I assume partial ordering. So X and precedes Y, this is something already decided by design. And you also have access to extra data in form of other variables. I'm going to call those other variables V. And I'm going to assume partial ordering. So I know my causal graph, V will precede X and Y, but I don't know exactly who there might be useful to do an adjustment, because it's not necessarily the case that just plugging all of them, that will be enough 
or even that might be even harmful to use all of them. I'll show some examples later on. And so put constraints on the possible causal graph underlying the system. And on top of this, I'll put some constraints on the distribution that is generated by the system. And something called a faithfulness assumption, which is something that relates the distribution that you can observe. So observational data will come from a distribution that I'm just calling P. And from there, I want to be able to say something about the structure of the, of the system. <clears throat> so this faithfulness assumption is all about independence constraints. I'm going to show an example soon. This, of course, may seem wasteful because there are all sorts of other information that is being excluded here. One of the reasons why people like that, one is it's simple, and two is there's no parametric as it gets. Or it doesn't matter which shape P is, independence is independence. It's just a factorization of a distribution. So this assumption says that if you have an independence constraint, the distribution, you have to have something, you have, you have this if and only if relationship between an independence constraint, the distribution, and independence is in the causal graph, whatever that is. Of course, I don't know how many of you are familiar with graphical models and reading independence from causal graphs. But essentially, the notion of independence can be defined for a graph too. I'm not going to get into details here, but missing edges basically correspond to independence statements. So I'm just going to show you one example. So these are independence statements that I can empirically test on the observation distribution. Let's say I can, again, verify that x is not independent of y. I can verify there's some z that makes them independent. So the little symbol here means independence was created by my colleague at UCL, Phil David, 40 years ago. <laughs> so this somehow constrained the possible causal graphs that are compatible with that distribution under the Faithfulness assumption. So it boils down to these three possibilities. You cannot have essentially the graph where these two arrows point to Z. It's something that people call explaining away the intuition behind that is if you have these two guys as being causes of Z, so if I knew something about this outcome <clears throat> that explains some variability of this guy, so to have extra information about the other guy. So this wouldn't be able to be true if these both X and Y were causes of Z. So I exclude that possibility, I left with three others if you ignore hidden common causes. This is what some people call a Markov equivalence class. Now, why is this useful? Well, in the setup that I mentioned to you, I uh, imagine I only, this is the true causal graph, this blue uh, edges and circles there. <clears throat> in this blue causal graph, the actual distribution will tell that same story from the previous graph. The previous example, I have partial ordering formation. I mentioned to you that I do know some partial ordering. W precedes X and Y. <clears throat> And under the faithfulness assumption, if, if I'm able to verify that from observational data, I can show to you that faithfulness implies there are no hidden common causes between X and Y. The reason for that is if this guy existed, then this independence statement would be false. It would be false for the same reason that I mentioned before, these two guys being causes of X if I tell what this guy is, I restrict what this guy can be, what this guy can vary. So I would have some information about Y2 passing from U. So this would not be true under faithfulness, and yet it is according to observational distribution. Therefore, I exclude the possibility of a hidden common cause. <clears throat> If there are no hidden common causes, the adjustment is trivial. I can essentially just regress Y on X. Binary case, this would give me the average treatment effect. So I essentially reduced the causal query to a probabilistic statement that I can estimate from observational data. <clears throat> okay, so people have all sorts of uses for that. Sometimes when the when piece of literature where you see this being used as in systems biology, you have large systems of <clears throat> Uh, measurements of metabolite behavior, like concentrations of proteins. You have some partial information on what might possibly precede each other. <clears throat> well, sometimes you have natural experiments in your genome 
there are some variables like the location of particle, particle genetic structures, which is believed to be random. Some people call that Mendelian randomization. So this tells you partially the ordering of some variables and allows you to make some claims on whether some variables are not confounded. So it allows you to make, at least for some of these variables, estimates of the causal relationship between them, even though you didn't do any particular intervention or study on that. Okay? So at the very least, this provides an exploratory data analysis tool for promising causal relationships that eventually may want to filter before taken to the lab because there's just way too many combinations of promising relationships in a large, large biological system. Now I can generalize that, as I mentioned to you, that example is if you have no confounders, it can tell under some situations where there are no confounders. <clears throat> it can also generalize this idea uh, to identify some variables which would be enough to deconfound your treatment outcome. <clears throat> so this is a paper that, uh, from another group of people uh, AI stats 2013, showing ways of generalizing that idea. <clears throat> if you need to find a set Z, that would deconfound X and Y. So they, they show that this is enough to uh, identify this set Z. It's actually necessary without further assumptions to have those conditions, otherwise you cannot tell anything. <clears throat> so well, don't need to understand exactly what goes on here. Basically, again, things I can test with my observational data. So if you can test this condition, you're able to say, I have under the faithfulness condition proof that Z is enough to remove confounding between X and Y. Okay, using some extra variable W, or W and Z here, but belong to that set D that I mentioned to you of auxiliary variables. <clears throat> now, all looks nice and clean so far. See what this faithfulness condition can buy you in terms of what observational data uh, provides already. But the thing, of course, is this fitness condition might fail or being very close to fail, and so your conclusions will be wrong. This is an example, again, using linear systems, same idea that the labels and the edges represent coefficients in a linear equation. So you may have a system like this, that somehow this coefficient here cancels out the contribution of other paths between Z and Y and cancels out in a way that you have exactly that same pattern that I saw be we showed before between X, Y, and Z. The same, the same dependency statements I used in my previous example. So if you have that and you assume faithfulness, this is the structure that's compatible with it. So it's not, the, it's not the ones I have before, it's a complementary one that identifies this should be pointing out towards X. <clears throat> so if you observe this, and you have some faithfulness, you actually get that, which gets the cause effect between X and Y completely wrong. You actually get the wrong direction in that. You flip it. Of course, you don't want this to happen. You may think, oh, this seems very unnatural because this looks like a fine balancing. It doesn't seem right to me that this fine balancing would happen. So I shouldn't be worried about these faithfulness violations. <clears throat> but in practice, things are much harder than that. Because even though you may think this particular balancing will not happen, the nature will not be that adversarial to you, <coughs> empirically, if you give me any sample size, I can give you a particular configuration that does not violate faithfulness, but to which you cannot distinguish from an unfaithful distribution with the data that you have. Essentially, you can have always empirical unfaithfulness for any sample size that you give to me. Just making these contributions that's always close and close and closer as your sample size increases. So it's not that simple that you can just say, this is unnatural, let's not worry about this. In practice, you do need to worry about that. <clears throat> Now, what I propose here, my colleague was, well, let's take a compromise. Let's not assume strict faithfulness. Let's not assume that independence constraints in a distribution will correspond to missing edges. Instead of corresponding to missing edges, let's say they correspond to weak edges, 
according to a problem-specific hyperparameter. So the motivation there is even though you may have this almost constellations, essentially assuming that it's much less natural to have a strong effect canceling a strong confounder. This, there is a history behind that that comes again from epidemiology and that if you need a uh, particular constellation that comes from violations of faithfulness, if you do have a constellation and the effect is strong, you also need a strong confounder. And this might be implausible under some reasonable background knowledge. Okay? So this is the principle we start with. Generalize faithfulness not to be a yes, no question that independence implies a lack of an edge, but instead create this continuum of possibilities, again regulated by hyperparameters, that independence should correspond to weak edges in some particular technical sense. So if you have this setup that I mentioned to you, <coughs> treatment outcome, some auxiliary variables, and according to that paper that I mentioned to you, you may have some variable W that potentially can tell that Z deconfounds the relationship. What I'm going to say here is if you find this variable W, uh, just like, just refresh on it, this variable W here, which I call a witness to Z being a possible deconfounder, then instead of assuming a sparse graph, I still assume a fully connected graph with possible hidden common causes, everything connected to everything, but where I would regulate some edges to be weak. And what this means is you look at the parameterization of this model with this latent variable, so if you imagine a typical graphical model, a DAG, a directly cyclic graph model, where they have this conditional distribution, right? Probability of this guy giving its parents in the graph, so the parameters of this latent variable model, you can define weak edges by, assume, by defining how much variability some of these factors will have when you wiggle one of these inputs. So for example, if you wiggle, if you wanted to say this edge is weak, this W, Y edge is weak, you look at the relationship between y and w in this factor, you would say uh, it doesn't change much. So this is this factor here, eta. This factor doesn't change much as w goes from zero to one. And you have this hyperparameter epsilon there bounding the contribution of that edge. So with this quantification, what a weak, a weak edge actually means. Now, once you define these constraints, the idea is to use somehow the data that you can see to be able to find bounds on the cause effect. So the data that you see, <coughs> the distribution, the observation case, so in this situation here, um, I'm ignoring Z just for simplicity. So I'm pretending Z is just the empty set here, just to simplify the notation later on. You can generalize to include the Z there. So what boils down to is that you have this joint distribution between X and Y given W, and you want to match that to a possible latent variable model without explicitly modeling the latent variable. Because as I mentioned to you, I'm not going to be able to identify that. So there's no point in having an explicit latent variable model there. What you want to have is whatever that model is, it needs to match the marginal distribution that you see. It's one of the key ideas behind much of econometrics, for example, where they try to have some sort of understanding between a natural occurrence in the economy that will explain some causal relationship. When you have, for example, a drought that kills a particular um, uh, uh, plantation of rice, for instance, this might have an effect in, economy, in the economy downstream. It might override some of the common causes that they have there. And this will imply some constraints on the marginal distribution. So these constraints can be implied in terms of these integral equations. This is in one sense an integral, right? You're integrating away u, you're matching that to a particular quantity that you can see. So if you're able to solve these integral equations, you'll be able to find what the distribution of u is, but are not able to. What they're able to say is this will constrain the possible causal relationships that I have. And can actually combine these constraints here 
with this marginalization constraint and actually write down a linear program in terms of the causal relationship between X and Y. So there's a whole machinery behind that. I'm not going to get into the details, but it boils down to all these constraints add up to a linear program where this guy can be made a decision variable. So if you wanted to get bounds on the cause effect, what do you do? Well, an upper bound would be a maximization problem. Maximize uh, the difference between the treatment levels here under the constraints that specified. You want to want, if you want a lower bound, you minimize that objective function. This gives you bounds on a cause effect. <clears throat> so I had to make this, this word play with my colleague in this paper because I would call this variable W. You want to be protected against violations of faithfulness using a linear program. We call this method the witness protection program. It's not as sketchy as I thought it would be. So this, these bounds may be informative, they be, may be uninformative as a consequence of your assumptions, but instead of having a yes, no situation, this discrete situation that we have with the faithfulness condition, allow domain experts to come up with possible bounds on this. So this is user specified. If you think this independence constraint cannot possibly correspond to a very strong cause effect, encode that in terms of these hyperparameters. And if you're not satisfied with the answer, this bound is too loose, uh, tough luck. You just don't have enough information in your data to give a more precise answer, at least not with these assumptions. Now, oh yes. Now, as I, as I thought, I only was able to talk about one thing here, just as a final observation here. <clears throat> in many situations, you do want to have a measure of uncertainty. So the data plays a role here by the observation distribution, right? You could plug in a point estimate of that and then turn the crank of the linear program and get a point estimate of the bounds. But in practice, many people will want to see some measure of uncertainty. <clears throat> So I can do, for example, if you want a Bayesian inference, you can put a pry on this distribution <coughs> under the constraints and then get a posterior, not under the cause effect, but posterior on the bounds of the cause effect. Because you just get a sample from the posterior of P, plug this in the linear program, it spits out a maximization, minimization result. That's one sample from the distribution or the bounds. <coughs> What you don't want to do is to pretend that you can get away of the identifiability problem. So if you think you can just put a prior on a latent variable model because based on inference doesn't require models to be identifiable, this is all nonsense. I mean, you can put a prior if you have actual information about the latent variable, it's totally fine to put an informative prior. If you put a prior of convenience, you're just creating uh, gibberish. So this is an example from simulated data. <coughs> So you have a latent variable model of all these variables I mentioned to you. You can calculate what the treatment effect would be under this model. So if you sample from the parameters, you can calculate what the, the treatment effect would be. So if you have a pry on the latent variable model, you have a pry on the treatment effect. So this greenish thing here would be a particular prior that is implied in the treatment effect. So if you want to calculate bounds on that, you can. So that's what these dashed gray lines here mean. So these are the bounds that are informed by the model. <clears throat> but if you wanted to pretend you can estimate the latent variable model, you could draw the crank of some Markov chain Monte Carlo with some prior on that latent variable model and get postures over the treatment effect instead of bounds on the treatment effect. And you would get things that is totally dependent on the prior because the data tells you absolutely nothing between these bounds. This is zero information on that data, what happens in between these bounds. Anything that your base analysis there would give it to you is entirely driven by the prior. Okay, they're just examples of different priors leading to different posteriors, and this red line here is the actual treatment effect. All right? So if you want to show what actually happens in the analysis, you can calculate priors, you can put priors on the on the constrained distribution. This is a, just an illustration 
those hyperparameters that I mentioned to you, this example is 0 0.2, the epsilon parameter. What you get is posteriors on the upper bound, lower bound, which of course are correlated, they're not independent. You can calculate, can display posterior distributions on the upper bound, lower bound. You can do some sensitivity analysis. This is if you can have more than one witness compatible with the constraints that you see. <clears throat> you may think these two are incoherent, but actually from a statistical perspective, they're statistically indistinguishable. So this is one thing that I'm certain can give it to you. And this is one of the lessons really I want to see get from this, you cannot really get away from identifiability without paying a price. The price here <clears throat> is that we not have a precise answer on the cause effect, but this is just what the data can possibly tell you. So if you're not ha happy with this, well, this is what, this is a consequence of your assumptions. This is what you can get if you don't want to assume some stricter background knowledge. Of course, you may want to analyze the sensitivity of our parameters. There's a whole literature on that, I'm not gonna get in detail on it. But this will provide you a flavor on what the types of basic techniques you can use for um, causal inference with observational data. Now, just to give one final word here, I was asked uh, by the people at the Turing Institute to spam you. So consider yourself spammed. This is a talk at the Alan Turing Institute that is open to the public by one of the experts on using machine learning for causal inference, uh, which we expect to be highly attended. So if you wanted to go to that, you had to register early on, and maybe I'll see you all there, okay? So thank you very much. Ricardo, we're running a little over time, so let's just have a couple of questions. Hello, um, I have two questions. Uh, the first is that on the first slide, when you mentioned the do operator, you said uh, y and w are invariant. What, what did that mean uh, exactly? Is the conditional probability distribution invariant or what? Or the, yeah, this is a good clarification question. So the graphical model, is composed of different factors. Uh -huh. So there's the factor that says the probability of common causes happening, the factor that says the probability of smoking given common causes, and the factor that says the probability of lung cancer given the other two. So this factor is overridden. It just becomes a constant. The other two factors, they, are, they remain variant. So if you learn these factors from that data, you can transfer them here to calculate your, your uh, due query. So that's a joint uh, probabilistic distribution? Yes, so the joint probabilistic distribution factorizes, and some of these factors are the same in both regimes. So okay. it's a kind of parameter sharing. Yeah, and the second question, do you have certain kind of di diagnostic uh, procedures in, uh, in the late, later slides? When, when you are considering performing an intervention, say, on variable X, if in the real reality, the X is actually a weakly influential variable, which should be in your W. So that means you, you, you picked the, the wrong uh, variable to influence on or to intervene on. Do, do you have any diagnostic procedure to check that? So intervene the wrong variable, I mean. Yeah, so what, what if the X you're considering intervene on should be in your W, which are the weakly influential, uh, influential variables? So if by that you mean you'd like to control Y using X, but X is not a very good control for Y, where they could tell something else would be a better control? No, I mean, I mean, 
x, the variable you're considering intervening on, is not a truly strongly influential variable. Mm -hmm. Do you have any procedure to check, to test on that? Well, some of these methods are used for experimental design. So if you have, if you use observational data to somehow filter out possible ways of controlling, of influence Y by some other control, you may be able to say before the experiment that the cause effect of X on Y is very weak. So to try to say, okay, let's not even go to the lab trying to control X. It looks like the evidence that X is a useful way of controlling Y points out that X is mostly useless. Let's see something else. So people do have ways of using this in bandit modeling, using reinforcement learning. Even if you have only bounds, the bounds themselves might be informative on saying, okay, this way of achieving, Y for example, could be a reward function. So you say I want to maximize Y by controlling this X, or from my current data, X doesn't seem promising. So let's see what else might be promising to maximize Y. This is one of the ways that people use observational data. Right. One more question. At the back. Um, one thing I wanted to say to was the straight line between the, uh, when you have the fully connected model, yeah. you have a straight line, but it has no arrows on there. All right. Yes. So you had something relating. <laughs> Z and U, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and W. Yeah. So this just means it doesn't matter whether what the causal ordering among them is, or whether they have other common causes. Yeah. Is, is that just? I didn't explain this notation, but that, that's what it means. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, let's thank Ricardo again. So just a couple of quick community announcements, a word from the sponsor.